Um, so I'm grinning ear to ear today because two of the coolest people I know have, have volunteered to join up with us, uh, John Mel Melvin and, and Paul Clyde. Um, John was, was my mentor, which makes him kind of old, but not that old, um, and, and is probably the most influential rehab doctor of his generation in the world that is not hyperbole, been president of everything. And, and what I noticed when John stopped being president of the societies, they call him into the meeting, they all talk, 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 and then they say, John, what do you think? And then they do what John says. So um, he, he started out as a real live scientist and a real live clinician and, and has become one of the great leaders uh, in, in the world in our field. And John, if I can, uh, let's, let's give you maybe about 10 minutes to kind of just, just describe where you're from and what you're about and what, what interests you have. Okay, well, as you probably know, I'm retired now and my interest is to do things like this free, just like uh, Tom does. Um, I, th I thought I would share some ideas, I mean, some experiences just to show you where I come from. Um, I uh, actually have been around in PM&R for a long time. I started my residency in 1961. And um, I, um, I finished the residency in 66 and started on the faculty at Ohio State. And I was a faculty member, um, an active uh, working faculty member until 2017. And um, from 73 to 2016, uh, I was in charge of the clinical services, including the inpatient services. But uh, one reason I say how long, and I'm not trying to say I'm an old person, but so much as to say that I've been around a long time and I've observed a lot that's gone on. And uh, we think about the US, you know, being a hotbed of uh, rehabilitation. But when I started, it, it was um, not that, that well accepted a field. Um, it, there were some nice, good centers. And there were a lot of places where there was absolutely nothing. And uh, so we always called ourselves proselytizers because we were selling rehabilitation. Uh, we were advocates for rehabilitation. And for instance, even in, during my residency, I would be giving lectures uh, to various uh, professional groups. What is uh, rehabilitation? What, and uh, including medical societies, nursing groups, OT groups, uh, all kinds of different groups. So. Uh, we were involved, and I've been involved all my life now, in a lot of uh, advocacy. Um, now, we, we talk about having units versus treating patients in the acute uh, hospitals. Uh, one of my first jobs actually was providing rehabilitation services to the patients in the acute rehabilitation, uh, in the acute hospital of Ohio State University, their, their university hospital. Uh, the, the point was that at that time we had so many patients that we couldn't get them into the rehab center uh, right when they were ready to go. And so we basically uh, gave them a full rehabilitation program until we, they were able to go there. And if they got better fast, why, well, of course, they went straight home. And, and so nobody in the U.S. knows now about doing full rehab during the acute phase. But that was a very common thing at one time. And uh, Although I was always associated with a university and a large hospital uh, in my for first years, um, all the way up until 91, I, I did consulting at peripheral community hospitals, sometimes as far away as 30 miles from the uh, uh, university hospital. And th that was useful because uh, there again, there would be people in these communities who uh, did not want to leave the community. And so if they needed rehabilitation, Again, they got it in a community acute hospital. And, and usually one not uh, exceptionally uh, endowed in rehabilitation services. So it was doing what you could because that's what the patients uh, demanded. Um, so during, during my career, I, um, I basically was at four places, Ohio State and the University, the Medical College of Wisconsin and the, medical, uh, the Milwaukee Medical Complex. Um, Moss Rehab, which is a um, you know, very advanced rehab hospital in Philadelphia, and Thomas Jefferson University. And as I pointed out, I, I was, for all but the first one, I was in charge of them. And I, I will say that they were all different uh, challenges, and uh, the, the management of them uh, was uh, difficult. And, and even though it was in a developed country, I would say that some of the principles that had to be dealt with, like 
uh, doing things with restricted resources, trying to get people to uh, be able to do the various jobs, uh, actually carries over into the low income and uh, middle income area. So it's not totally uh, different. Um, I started being involved internationally in 1980 when I became secretary of the International Federation of uh, PM&R and, uh, and was an officer in one of the international organizations until uh, 2004 when I uh, finished being the past president of the International Society of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine. And as Andy pointed out, I still uh, am invited to all of the um, governance meetings. Uh, I, I think part of it's because uh, I was a part of the group that put together these organizations and we wrote the bylaws and the statutes. And uh, so uh, one good way of controlling an organization is to know the statutes inside and out and maybe even to be able to change them <laughs> because uh, frequently that's what they're asking advice about. Um, yeah, I wrote some of this down because I wasn't sure I'd be able to remember it all. I, I've been active in the WHO. Uh, I did some just consulting to the director of the rehab section. Uh, and then I was a, a, a member of the advisory group uh, for uh, ICD-11, which is still, well, it's, it started some places, but it's mostly not out yet. Uh, the major th thing about that that uh, uh, I like is that it has a place for uh, adding functioning information as a part of the standard uh, uh, credit you know, uh, classification. Uh, I also edited uh, two handbooks for um, mid-level health professionals, uh, uh, health providers, I guess the uh, WHO calls them, uh, one on brain injury and one on uh, amputee. So, you know, the focus on uh, non-traditional specialties uh, was there. And uh, I, I, I authored four monographs on rehabilitation also for the uh, one core, uh, where they were sort of like curricula, one core curriculum and, um, and uh, three uh, more advanced uh, curriculum. And then uh, I was a member of the group uh, that submitted that technical meeting report that I distributed to all of you that talked about making the case for um, rehabilitation uh, in uh, low and mid-level uh, areas. So uh, uh, some general comments that I thought, I, I think I still have what, five minutes or four or something. Uh, yep. Anyway, um, I think it's important to step back in the beginning and realize that advocating for the development of rehab services uh, is work. It takes active people, uh, sort of sort of enthusiastic people, um, and and it's it's non-ending. Uh, I started being an advocate in, uh, as I said, during the residency when I was out trying to get people to understand what rehabilitation was, and I'm still doing it. And uh, I'm still on multiple committees that are trying to get the government to do whatever we would like them to do, which. Uh, uh, sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't. Um, so uh, if one decides that they really want to be an advocate, it's, 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 a, it, it's a major part of one's um, being. And, uh, and it takes a, a certain amount of energy, sort of like an Andy Hay energy level. <laughs> um, the issues are complex. And um, so it, it isn't like one can come up with just a simple answer. And um, uh, I, I like to think of them as in three different categories. One's more technical, what, what's good rehab, uh, what, what should be there. Um, financial, uh, which is always important in these days in healthcare, and then political. And political has always been a major issue with uh, rehabilitation and people that do rehabilitation. Um, essentially, uh, uh, the, the political side is who does what and uh, uh, how do you allocate the resources uh, if you take some from somebody else, how, how do you deal with explaining that, and I know that's behind a lot of the questions. Uh, and some strategies that I, I think are overall, overall strategies is that I think that each case, each place has to analyze their own situation. Uh, there may be similarities in terms of generalities, but I think the actual reality of how to try to get something done is different each place. And, uh, and so it means taking the time and effort to analyze objectively, uh, because sometimes we get emotionally involved or uh, subjectively, and that then distorts our ability to really read the situation and see what we can do to influence it. And, and I, I think it's important to um, uh, seek out and, and identify uh, the decision makers. 
Uh, and that has to do again with what kind of problem it is and also what turns on that decision maker. If it's a, a legislator that's gonna get elected, if he's in favor of things that are humanitarian, there, that's one thing. If it's a hospital administrator that worries about uh, how much money per bed he makes per day, uh, that's another thing. And so it's important to, uh, to match that uh, very carefully. Um, I think that it actually, uh, Accepting incremental goals is often a necessary uh, approach. My own model is I, I like to have my big comprehensive goal that may be 10 years, 15 years away, uh, and then work on incremental steps to get there, uh, knowing, having figured out how those steps relate to getting to the ultimate goal. Uh, one reason not to do that is that you can start to implement things that are helping you get to the goal that actually you have opponents who don't want you to achieve, but you can start building the framework, uh, uh, the foundation of getting there so that by the time they realize what you've been doing, it's too late. Um, and I think that uh, what's really important of the rehab people is that they have to integrate themselves into the healthcare system. Um, when I started out, um, most of the PM&R doctors were what I called basement boys. Uh, they were mostly male, or I think almost all. Uh, they were in the basement of the hospitals because they used a lot of uh, hydrotherapy, and that's where it was more effective to put it. And they used to have contracts where they would see every patient, no matter what, that was going to get therapy, no matter what. Uh, so they would write to, you know, 50 times a day, uh, three-point gate with cane in the right hand. Um, the, uh, the first thing I did is got rid of that when I went to Milwaukee, Andy, uh, uh, because I took the position that we're specialists. And uh, so uh, we'll, let, we'll wait till you ask for us to do some something some special. But in the meantime, you have to get out there. You have to, whatever the socialization framework of, of the physicians that uh, make referrals and that you're going to collaborate with, uh, yeah, that needs to be penetrated. It, it used to be the coffee uh, room for the medical staff. Uh, I don't think that's quite so much anymore. But, but the point is that uh, you've, uh, you've got to get out and be seen, uh, be known as another doctor, not as, so that you, you are projecting that you're not just uh, somebody doing physical therapy. You're, you're involved in a certain type of patient, which includes adding the rehabilitation or, or therapy aspects that it might take. And then the final point I guess I would make is that I think that the report, the technical report of the um, WHO committee on uh, looking for the case report um, has some really good pieces to it. And uh, I think that one should uh, really kind of get to know, uh, particularly I thought the part on challenges and issues that are on four, pages 14 and 15, and then uh, table three, which are the benefits of, of rehab. So that's my introduction. Fantastic, thank you, John.